Now, the topic for this hour is, you'll see on your sheet there, Life in the Kingdom, Discipleship as Life in the Kingdom. Uh, there's so much to say about the kingdom, we try to get a good bit of it said, uh, but the questions do come up, and I'm going to reinforce that today, is why don't we hear more about the kingdom? Why is that? And uh, I remember Peter Wagner, a rather famous teacher and practitioner of a few decades ago. Is he still going? Peter's still going, you think? Peter Wagner? I don't know. He yeah. was here, right? In I think you're right. Yeah. He's come to Colorado Springs, which is the doorstep to heaven. But he, he uh, some time ago, he made a statement to the effect that, well, every New Testament scholar would tell you that what Jesus taught was the kingdom of God uh, and discipleship and all of that. But he said, I, do, I can't quite believe this. He said, I've never heard anyone preach on it. And he said, when I dig through my own sermon barrel, I don't find anything on the kingdom of God. Now, Peter was into big gifts and church growth through the presence of gifts and all of that. And still, there it is. It's not there. So that's an interesting question. You might want to ask yourself that question. Um, do I preach on the kingdom of God? Do I teach on the kingdom of God? Say anything about it. Many people think the church substitutes for the kingdom of God. They, they honestly think that. And you go back, you find that the Roman Catholic Church in its heyday identified itself with the kingdom of God. So you don't need to say anything about the kingdom, we just talk about the church. So uh, that's something worthy of thinking about, but I can't think about it very much now. I have to go on to some other things. But that's going to be the background question now with what we do in this hour. So we start with, we're going to talk about discipleship. And so we'll start with uh, Jesus' statement here. You will recognize it. I have been given say over everything in heaven and in earth. <coughs> Excuse me. Power, that's, I've been given power, that's, the word is akousi, it's probably better translated authority. I've been given say, I like that language, because that's what it means. So, go, or really, as you go, is the best way of understanding that passage. So, as you go, make apprentices to me among people of every kind. All nations. The reference is primarily to Gentiles, non-Jews. Submerge, submerge them in the reality of the Trinitarian God and lead them into doing everything I've told you. Okay. Now, notice how that's worded and put it over against the old wordings and try to get the sense of what is being said. Now look, I'm with you every minute until the job is completely done. Now in order to understand what's going on, you have to understand what's going on here, you have to take that back to the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham's covenant, God said, I will multiply you and make you a blessing to all of the families of the earth. This is how it works. This is how the Abrahamic covenant comes into the modern world. Now, the first step 
is make disciples. So we have to talk now at length about what that is and something about how you might do it. But if you were going to make disciples, you would need to know what you were making, wouldn't you? You would need to know when you had one made. So what, if you disagree with me about that, at least if you think we're going to do that, you need to understand what you mean by disciple. What is a disciple? Now you get many, many complaints about the church today, right? And it's almost like the constant background noise in religious circles. What's wrong with the church? So let me say something to you up front, and then I'll go back to it at the end. There isn't a thing wrong with the church today that discipleship wouldn't cure. Not a thing. And if you don't get discipleship into the mix, you're just going to create another church with all of its problems. And unfortunately, that is how it turns out for many people who are ready to get rid of their church. They're not talking about making disciples. They're talking about having different kinds of services and maybe saying something different in their message and so on. And that's fair game. But if it doesn't come to discipleship, you're just going to create another organization that will have all the human problems that the present does. Most of the things that get in trouble in churches shouldn't even be there. Like, for example, who's mad at who? Right? See, that, that shouldn't even be an issue. But that's not in the package as it's presented. So now, I word disciples here, apprentices, you could translate it students, make students to me among all people of every kind. And that is actually, that has happened and it has tremendous effects. And it has varying degrees of intensity through the ages. But that always marks the high points. And the people you tend to read about as having done it are people who were disciples. Right? So you look at someone, take the obvious cases like St. Francis of Assisi. What do you see when you see him? You see a disciple. Right? Madame Guillaume, a disciple. John Wesley, a disciple. John Calvin, a disciple. Yeah, see, that's what marks the high points. That's because implicitly everyone knows what it's about. And with all of these people, you have a wave that follows, goes on sometimes for generations. One of the remarkable things about the Wesleyan movement was how long it lasted. But that's because Wesley was a real genius at simple organization. And he, he more or less was able to farm out the church to the Anglicans, which he remained all of his life. And he let them take care of church. And he did some things that really mattered. <laughs> right? Right? His, the assemblies, the class meetings, the band societies, and so on. Man, those are world-transforming things. And they proved that and created a great wave that went around the, the world. I know when I first started going to South Africa in uh, 1985, I think it was, the Methodist churches there still refused to call themselves churches. They called themselves societies. See. And for example, you have cases in, in this country, in North America, that were doing the same thing. Like, why is the Christian Missionary Alliance called an alliance? Because it wasn't, couldn't be a church, it was an alliance. Now, you see that same thing over and over and over again. And the, what 
what is held up is always discipleship. You never have a movement that says, well, come and be a nominal Christian. (laughs) (laughs) So it is uh, very important that we understand this. An apprentice to me, people of all kinds, no social political distinctions or other kinds of cultural distinctions, and bring them into the presence of God, the Trinitarian reality, submerge them in that, You can get them wet if you want to, but that's not what this is talking about. Not talking about getting people wet in various and sundry ways. It's talking about submerging them in the Trinitarian presence. See, Jesus said, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in their midst. And he brings the other people. He brings the Father and the Holy Spirit. They all come together. Two or three gathered in my name there. I'm, now, when do we usually say that? When two or three people show up. Right? But he's in, the, he's in the midst when two or three thousand gather in his name. And it's just an illustration of how we're apt to forget him if we've got lots of people. about the Trinitarian reality. Now then, once you've done that, then you're in a position to teach them how to do everything he said. Don't go there first, or you'll get up some legalistic scheme. You go first to discipleship. Make disciples. Now, it's a deep decision for those of us who lead and teach and pastor and administer and all of that is whether or not we're going to do that or we're going to do something else. He didn't say go make Christians. Mm. Sure didn't say go make Baptists. <laughs> that would be okay if they were disciples. Nothing wrong with being a Baptist or a Christian. But you want to be a disciple and then everything else will take care of itself. Okay? Okay. So now this is your mission statement. This is your church growth plan. And there's never been a church growth plan that succeeded with anything close to the success of this plan. And you can check that out historically. Some of you may know the writings of Rodney Stark, but others have done a lot to make clear how well this succeeded and how it succeeded. It succeeded in simple ways. Like the Christians wouldn't desert the city when the plague hit. Now that's, that's pretty, pretty impressive. And that's being your light shining, isn't it, in the darkness. Right? And they found out things like if you took care of people who are sick, they more apt to live. And so the idea of caring for people institutionally and otherwise, and they, uh, they picked up the, deba- the, the abandoned babies, usually girls, and they stood against that, and they stood against the games, so-called, in the Colosseums, and they gradually, that had a terrible effect on the old society because it killed it. And it had to be reformed, and by that time, the leadership was powerful enough to inject this. But now, we do have to just work on this idea of a disciple. And as usual, I want to say to you, you don't have to believe what I say, okay? Um, But do have something. So who is an apprentice of Jesus? You have to start with the biblical model. Who were the disciples of Jesus in his day? Well, they were people who um, were with him. They were with him. Someone in this group has been talking about the dust of the rabbi, which is a wonderful picture and 
helps us get a new impression of what that was like because we really don't know much about how that worked. But the idea of the dust of the rabbi is you walked with the rabbi and got covered with the dust he kicked up as he walked down the road. And uh, the idea of being with, why were you with him? You were learning to be like him. That's the original picture of the disciple. With Jesus, learning to be like him. Now, of course, he is with us in a way that is actually better than how he was with the original disciples. He has arranged for that. And when he comes to tell his people he's going to leave them, he says, now don't, don't worry, I'm going to send another paraclete. I'm going to send another, we translated comforter, but that has too much association with that nice, nice fluffy thing that you sleep under. And uh, paraclete is more like, you know, the cleats on your shoes. It grabs things, a cleat, a paraclete. And he's going to be with you, and he's going to make me present to you. He's going to never leave you. He's always with you. And uh, so we can be with Jesus now. We have to choose to do that. We have to choose to do that, and we have to learn how to do it. And what are we learning? We're learning to live our lives in the kingdom of God as he would lead my life if he were I. Now, see, try that on. Just work it through. See what you can get out of it. A big point in my wording it that way is to help us understand that the focus is our life, not his life, our life. I am learning to lead my life in the kingdom of God as Jesus would lead my life if he were I. You see, we have to really think that thought, how could he be me? Could he be me? And it's only if you believe that he could do that that you'll be prepared to be his disciple in everything you do and everything you are. And otherwise you'll park him in some special place and then you'll walk off and do stuff on your own, and most of your life will be devoted to you and not to God. So when we come to this point in the discussion, we have to be careful to remember what the kingdom of God is. It's God acting. Where I'm in the kingdom of God, I'm living in his care and provision, and his power is working with me. And everything that I confront, good or bad, I confront as standing in the kingdom of God. And uh, that, of course, itself is a large part of what we have been learning more of as we lead our apprenticeship time with Jesus. So now... I am with him in all of my circumstances, learning to be like him. Now, we, that, that is not easy to translate into our habits of thought and feeling. So we have to understand that's something you work at. What is it to do that? And we get a lot of help just from looking at how the people did and talked about it in the Bible. For example, in Isaiah, is it 26? You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now trust there is expectation. I expect him to be with me. How do I do? I keep my mind fixed on him. And we'll talk a little bit tomorrow about Frank Laubach's game of minutes and other ways that people have learned to do this. I always have my mind fixed on him. Psalm 16. I have set the Lord always before me. 
He is at my right hand. Now, if you're left hand, when you read that, you say my left hand, okay? <laughs> he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. You know that verse? That's a good one, isn't it? Casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. That's a good one. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And when the time is right, he'll lift you up. Those are wonderful words, aren't they? That's the solid core. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will smooth your paths. Right? Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, I think. That's close, anyway. You see how that just comes up over and over? See that? We, we learn to do that. We learn to do that. We have to want to do it, and we have to decide to do it, and then we learn to do it. But the core is expectation. We expect God to be with us. And we expect that that will be manifested in terms of what happens in us and around us. Things will be given to us in our thoughts. Burdens will be lifted in our emotions. Circumstances that we can't understand and figure out what to do about will resolve themselves. Hmm? You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in you. See, that's, that's the heart of this now. And as we do that in all of our circumstances, then we experience the kingdom of God with us. And we look at those verses like Hebrews 13. Keep your lives free of covetousness. Be content with such things as you have because he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, I may boldly say, God is my helper. I will not be afraid of what men will do to me. See, open secret, that's what it's all about. And then the people who move on in discipleship, who go on to receive the wonderful life of the kingdom, they're the ones that constitute the high mountain peaks of Christian history. And we look back at them, and we know we ought to be like that. Sometimes we think maybe we can't be, but it would be good if we, we read perennial classics like Brother Lawrence, The Practice of the Presence of God, Thomas Akempis. See, that's, that's the hard stuff, the good stuff. Sometimes, some, I mentioned uh, Madame Guillaume, many people don't know about her as they know about Thomas Akempis and so on. But she's a wonderful illustration of this kind of life. So now then, maybe in question time you'll want to raise some questions about this. Uh, but let's go on. What are we learning as disciples? The three kinds of things we're learning, these are not separable, so don't think it. You know, when you teach, you separate stuff for purposes of analysis and discussion that often are not separable. Now, the first part is not surprising to people. You're learning to do as he did and what he taught. So you're learning that. And you have to learn how to do that. You don't do that by willpower. You don't learn how to ride a bicycle by willpower. You may need some willpower to get into it, but your learning is in the process that results. You are interacting with the reality of the bicycle and the road and all of that. That's a learning process. And of course, what happens is that your body actually learns. And what you tried to handle by thinking about it when you started, you get, it soaks into your bones and uh, you couldn't learn it, you hardly could manage it by thinking about it anyway, but now then you just get on the bicycle and go. You don't think about it. 
And uh, that's what happens in any learning process at all. That's a general life structure. Human beings are constructed so that they learn by habituation and have a choice about what they learn and are able to learn in such a way that they can then build on top of that and do other things while this is going on down here. Uh, uh, a singer, Pavarotti, when he was at his height, did beautiful things. Uh, and he did it because he had trained so that he didn't have to think about his breathing. He didn't say, well, I have to t make sure that I breathe right now. No, he's into his song. And his breathing takes care of itself and provides a foundation for him to do something unbelievably beautiful. And that's how learning in human beings works. There's, they are unique in the capacity to learn. They are different from all other living things in that regard. The, the degree to which they can actually learn and grow mentally and integrate that with all of their lives. Now, living in the kingdom of God is like that. It's the same sort of thing. You're learning, and as you learn, you have certain practices that help you, and some things become automatic, and then you are able to live interactive with God in the kingdom as Christ teaches you. Okay, so that's, that's the first part. Now that shows up in the Great Commission, doesn't it? Teach them to do everything I said. Now, see, any church or church group should be prepared for someone to come in and say, I want to learn how not to be disgusted with my colleagues. And the response should be, sure, we do that. Let's make an appointment. Now here's where we start, and here's how we move next. And if you do these things interactively with God, you'll be helped and all of that. And within six weeks, you'll stop being disgusted with your colleagues. Does that sound okay? Shouldn't take three years, should it? So you would think now that any, any church would be prepared to do that. Mm. Well, it might occur, you to, occur to you to say, but they're not. And then if you said that, the next question would be, why are they not? Is that something that fell out of the sky and hit them? Why are they not thinking in those terms? Now, I'm, I'm kind of mean about this, I guess, but I've been saying for many years, I don't know of a single organization that has a plan to teach their constituencies to do what Jesus said. And I'm still saying it. I'm looking for people who will say, Oh yes, we do that. Someone comes to our place and says, I want to be able to learn how not to have contempt for my colleagues. We have a program that we can take them right into and a fellowship that will support them. And within a short while, they will no longer have contempt for their colleagues. Or maybe someone who just wants to get rid of contempt. You know, among the many useless things we pick up is contempt. Now, it's true that the way human organizations work, if you're not contemptuous of the right people or things, then you're contemptible yourself. And what nearly every organization teaches, human organizations, is who to be contemptible of. And those of you who live in those situations, I think, know what that means. Could you teach someone to be free of contempt? Teach them in such a way that they would be free of contempt. We're not just talking about saying, no, no, you should not be contemptuous. I mean, you might teach them that. But the question is, how can you teach them in such a way that they are free of contempt? 
That's the path of discipleship. 